Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Melinda Ring. I'm the executive director of the Osher Center for Integrative Health at Northwestern University. And uh, we have this wonderful Grand Round series from the Osher Center done in collaboration with IFAM. So welcome. Um, today, I am thrilled to share uh, Dr. Pandya, who we've <laughs> looking forward to meeting him in person. Uh, in February at the consortium meeting for integrative medicine that's going to be in Chicago. But for now, I'm happy to share his wisdom virtually through this grand rounds. So Dr. Pandya is the medical director of stroke for Northwestern Medicine Del Nor Hospital. And he's very active just in bringing wellness in all kinds of ways, not just through patient care. So he's chair of the wellness committee for Northwestern Central DuPage. He's associate director of the Regional Scholars of Wellness program. And he also founded a B360 Integrative Wellness Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization for wellness. And um, really, Dr. Pandya's passion is um, specializing in integrative holistic care for cerebrovascular disease, which is such an important topic. We were already getting questions before the lecture uh, started. So um, that brings me to, if you have questions, please be sure to put them in the Q&A section. Um, and we will have time for them. I think we should have about 10 minutes at the end. Um, for uh, Dr. Pandya to answer questions from the audience. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ring, for such a warm introduction and, and inviting me to uh, talk about a topic that's uh, very, very close to me and, and something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, and thank you all for joining this afternoon uh, during your lunch, lunch time. So these are my disclosures before we get to the talk. Yeah, nothing uh, relevant to the talk. Uh, as Dr. Ring mentioned, I'm the founder and director of a uh, B360 Integrated Wellness Alliance, a uh, not-for-profit organization for, for well-being and mental health. This is, you know, when I was when I was thinking about this this grand round, I was trying to think about how to relate the, the message that I want to relate uh, in a most effective way. When I was doing a, a literature review, what I came to realize is this concept of integrative stroke care really doesn't exist in the US market. I think outside US, especially China, they talk a lot of this, this, this concept of integrative stroke care where they combine conventional medicine and complementary alternative medicine to provide care for their stroke patients. So I wanted to take this opportunity to make maybe introduce the topic of integrative stroke care, in which a lot of times people use it as a system of care, um, but not necessarily the, the same terminology as integrative stroke care. I just wanted to go back to the basic of why, what, and how. So why I think there's a need for integrative stroke care. What is the framework? You know, I wanna focus on a framework of what that means and how to use that framework, what are the evidence behind some of the concept that I will be talking about. So why there is need for integrative stroke care? This is a drawing from a study that was done uh, on stroke survivors. It was, it, was looking, it was called the LACE study, which looked at leisure or based creative engagement. Basically what they did was they, they uh, recruited stroke survivors and they participated two and a half weeks or seven weeks on a various different activities related to art, drawing, uh, clay, putting their timeline down, connecting with their uh, uh, research, uh, research group. And this is a, a drawing from a 59 year old who had a right sided stroke, so it impacted his right side of a body. And you know, he couldn't move his left, he was able to move his left side. What he described is that he worked with, a, with a, 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 another person who had a stroke that involved the left side of the body. They, how, how, how he described is that they worked together to hold the paper, to draw, to, to, to put this art together. 
Once he was done with the drawing, he realized that he was only putting things on the right side of the body. Indicative of the folk, the, the, their attention goes on the affected side. He left actually the left side completely blank. And then he went back and put some colors to demonstrate some uncomfortability he, he's having on the left side. And this is kind of what he said. I can visualize the two sides of my body reconnecting in my drawing. After the stroke, this was the first time that I sensed wholeness of my body. So the study had four major themes that they concluded. One, it helped stroke survivors to feel that they, feel they, they were connected to other people. Number two, they felt that they were connected to themselves. Number three, that they were glad to be alive. And number four, they were glad that they were given this opportunity to participate in something like this. Let me give you an example of a, two of my patients that have kind of somewhat motivated me to kind of think about this from an integrative stroke care perspective. This is a 45 year old female, so young, high functioning nuclear plant engineer who had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. We, we coiled her aneurysm, had a really, really good outcome. We thought this was a success story. She actually went home without any deficits. However, it was not until I started seeing her in the clinic, I started to realize perhaps it wasn't as success story as we think. She had significant symptoms of anxiety, PTSD. She was afraid to drive. She lost her job. This impacted her, her quality of life. She felt left out. Second patient, 57 year old male who had a brainstem stroke, brainstem stroke. He was found to have an intracranial atherosclerotic disease with severe narrowing of his basilar artery as shown on this picture here. He had uncontrolled risk factors, hemoglobin A1C of 13.8, LDL of 213, very poor coping mechanisms for stress. He relied on smoking and alcohol and lack of physical activity. These are perfect two patients on why I think the integrative stroke care can benefit from a recovery perspective beyond just physical recovery and to improve cardiovascular risk factors to prevent another stroke. So let's think about stroke in three steps. Stage one, stage two, stage three. Right? A lot of focus of the talk is the stage three, but stage one is kind of your primary prevention before stroke occurs. I, I think integrative care is also very, very important at that stage. As some of you may be aware, 80% of the strokes can be prevented by modifying risk factors. Stage two is when someone's had a stroke and they're in the hospital, right? This is where we have the most resources, most guidelines, uh, regulations, right? For rightful reason, right? This is where we're trying to minimize the impact from the stroke. And the science has evolved so much over the years, right? Where we have a data now, probably the best data in the entire medicine about uh, for mechanical thrombectomy to, to help reverse stroke to minimize the impact. The number need to treat for that is three patients. The post-stroke, the stage three, where we don't have any guidelines, any recommendations, and the data is really lagging. And believe it, or, believe it or not, regulation only recommend, requires just one parameter to measure after the stroke, which is modify ranking scale of functional status at 90 days. Why I think there's also need? Stroke is a high prevalence disease, impacting around 12.12 million people worldwide. So one stroke every three seconds. By the time we're done with this webinar, probably 180 people in the world would have a stroke. It is very costly. Costs our healthcare system estimated to be $451 billion. It impacts what matters to us the most, our quality of life, number one cause of disability. And it's growing. It is estimated that by 2030, 4% of the US population, adult population are projected to have a stroke. The other reason why the integrated stroke care is needed is because 87% of the burden is from chronic 
from, from cardio, for, from, from modified risk factors that we can control. Risk factors that we are all aware of, right? High blood pressure, diabetes, high, cholest uh, high cholesterol, weight, smoking, alcohol, nutrition, physical activity, air pollution. And the one thing that you may not be aware of is, is kidney disease, which, which has increased risk for stroke. The other reason I think integrated stroke care is needed is something that conventional medicine usually doesn't address. And in my opinion, this is actually one of the bigger risk fact, one of the risk factors that should be included in the top 10 at, at, for, for, for stroke risk, it's psychosocial stressors. These are things that we cannot measure or, or order images to, to, to check. These are things that we have to have a conversation with patients to understand their psychosocial stressors. Right? This was a Copenhagen study looking at self-reported stress, which increased the risk for fatal stroke. Another self -per uh, perceived another study looking at self perceived psychological stress increased risk for ischemic stroke case control study. Occupation stress increased risk for stroke. Chronic psychosocial stress predicted increased risk for stroke, include, including morbidity and mortality for middle aged men. Psychophysical stress also contributes. This was a, 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 a looking at a major life event, which increasing the risk for a stroke. The more and more, and I do, do this, I've gotten habit to ask patients, did something major happen before you came with, with symptoms of stroke? And more often than not, I hear that there, there, there was a major event that impacted, uh, that impacted them. I can't tell you the exact percentage, but that happens more often. This was a study looking at an older patient, psychosocial distress was a, a stroke risk. And a meta-analysis, which said that fatal and non-fatal uh, risk for stroke related to psychosocial stressors. What about unsolved, unresolved childhood trauma? And some of you may be aware of adverse childhood events, right? That has been linked to increased mental health uh, risk as well as chronic, chronic medical conditions. This is a, 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 a graph from my own cohort of patients. It's not published. We're actually putting, uh, we put together a, a poster for the, consort, the integrative uh, concern that's coming in end of, the, end of the month. And what we found is that patient who had a self-reported ACE question positive, they reported more sim symptoms related to stroke. And to none of our surprise, they also had a higher risk of chronic medical conditions like hyper, hypertension, lipidemia, sleep apnea, obesity, et cetera. Why there is a need? There's a significant morbidity complications associated with stroke, which a lot of times are unmet. As I already mentioned, it's a number one cause of disability. Things that matters to us most, our quality of life it gets impacted. Patients with stroke have up to 66% risk for developing depression after a stroke. 50 to 60% risk of dementia. 70% risk of fatigue. Right? A very nuisance symptom that we commonly see, which significantly impacts the recovery, participation in therapy, which ultimately impacts their outcomes. And then we also have to deal with the, the medical complications that occurs with it. Pneumonia, DVT, seizure, skin breakdown, uh, bone, shoulder issues. And then there is an occupational uh, unmet need. When can I go back to, to work? When can I start driving again? How is my, is, am I going to ever get better? Sexual performances, how is my asbestos is going to get better? Urinary blood, bladder incontinence. So multitudes of morbidity and unmet <laughs> symptoms that occurs after a, after a stroke that usually don't get addressed, uh, usually don't get addressed. And then there are uncontrolled cardiovascular risk. You would think that, you know, this would be better controlled after a stroke, but we all know that these are, these is, these are harder to control than we think. 50 to 80% still report symptoms, you know, hypertensions. 16% are still smoking. 
52% do not exercise. Only 17% achieve their BMI goal. And then there is an individual reason why we need integrative stroke care. A lot of them are scared to leave their home like the patients I mentioned. They're worried. They're frustrated with lack of resources and directions. They're angry. They felt like they've lost their lifestyle that they had prior to the stroke. They feel like they've been judged. They, they don't like the way they, they get treated. They feel dependent. They feel saddened, depression, as I mentioned. Social isolation, embarrassed, feel lonely. They feel burden on others, guilty, loss of self-esteem. Many of these symptoms are reported, which ultimately impacts their outcomes, participation in rehab, and their motivation to make lifestyle changes for prevention of stroke. These are some of the quotes that I've heard in my clinic, which motivates me to pursue the integrated stroke care framework. I fell through the cracks after returning home. I've lost the man that I married. I no longer feel like his wife. I don't know what my life will look like now. My husband is here yet I'm completely alone. Within a matter of seconds, I lost my husband and now I have a child. Also, there's a caregiver burnout. It's estimated to be up to 60% in some, some studies, which also impacts their well being, their mental health, their physical health, again, putting burden onto the health, health healthcare systems. Now that I kind of made a, made a point about why I think integrative stroke care is needed, let's talk about the framework behind it. So what is integrative health? It's a combination of conventional medicine, lifestyle and self-care, and complementary and alternative, uh, complementary and alternative healthcare. Right? And the name has evolved over time, as some of you may be aware. But integrative health is, is, combines all these three modalities into one. And there are different ways to approach these different modalities. And the way I think about this is, is, is in a framework. Because it's a multitude of symptoms that you're trying to address, multitudes of unmet needs, and address the cardiovascular risk factors, how can we put this in a package to provide support, resources, education for stroke survivors and their family? The framework that I really like from the one that I've, I have reviewed is the, the one from the Duke, Duke Integrative Medicine, where they put patients in the center, which are influenced by the lifestyle and the self-care, nutrition, physical activity, mind, body, physical and, and, and personal development, spirituality, social connections, which also is influenced through complementary alternative healthcare as well as conventional medicine. It's not a one-way phenomena, phenomena, it's a back and forth, um, back and forth where they influence each other. Let's think about this more in detail, right? So what is the conventional care doing for these patients? Very, very important, as, as I mentioned, for that stage two. Minimizing the impact from strokes. Helping with recovery. The one on the table on the wrap, the right, talks about the, the, the guidelines for recovery. And, and a lot of guidelines are focused on physical as well as cognitive improvement. But there's a lot of other unmet needs that usually do not get addressed by just simple conventional care. And then there's a prevention. And most of the focus is pharmacotherapy, whether it's for limited time. A lot of the other cardiovascular risk factors that we cannot measure do not get addressed on routine basis, like nutrition, physical activity, psychosocial stressors, sleep, and this is where I think the complementary and alternate lifestyle can, can be used as adjunctant therapy. This is a slide that I borrowed from my uh, co-fellow from my integrated medicine fellowship, basically breaking down into four separate components. You have the biofield component, 
which is the mind-body approaches like acupuncture, yoga, tai chi, meditation, mindfulness, spirituality. You have the biomechanical, chiropractor, massages, and the lifestyle, nutrition, physical activity, activity, social connection, and then biochemical, along with pharmacotherapy. Can we, is there a role for herbals and supplements to improve outcomes and prevent another stroke? So how do you use this framework? Set patients in the center, lifestyle, conventional, complementary, alternative medicine, all influencing each other. This is a second drawing from the, from the same study that I talked about. And let me read what this patient wrote. My life has been around my home, which is warm and filled with love. My home is beautiful, surrounded with colorful flowers. There are blue clouds and black clouds in the sky. Blue cloud represents ordinary days and black cloud represents fear and uncertainty. The black cloud is my stroke. I once wanted to give up. However, looking at my home, it is so filled with love especially from my family's love. It is their love that keeps me going. Although black cloud will never disappear, I wish, to, it, I wish it to become less impactful on my, my home. So when you think about a framework, you know, I, I at least think of it from a step, stepwise approach. Right? I think the first step is to establishing a baseline. One thing that we are, you know, one thing that I've learned in my fellowship as integrated medicine is how to be present with patients and family in the room. How to use the skills we learn, like the motivation interview, to understand the need, the complications that the patients and family may be suffering. And more importantly, understanding what stages of, of their healing are they in. Stroke is a, is, a, is a traumatic event in someone's life. It, it, it changes the way they think, their personality, their behaviors, uh, their social life. And everyone, everyone is in a different stage of grief when, when, they're, talk, when, when they're dealing with stroke. So if, if we're trying to make changes in their lifestyle, but if they're in the anger or denial or depression mode, it will be very difficult for us to uh, get to where we want them to go. So understanding their baseline helps us move them from these other grief stages to more of an acceptance stages. And once you have established this baseline, perhaps you've got them to the acceptance stage, like the lay study indicated, you can think about an action plan in a holistic action plan that incorporates all the modalities that mentioned here, right? Emotional, social, intellectual, physical, occupational, spiritual, environmental, and financial. How can we put together this framework unique to that individual patients, which is focuses on, which focuses on prevention and recovery? And this is a simplified version of what that can look like. Here are some examples of a paper that was published in, the, in a rehab journal, which talked about all the different aspects on what kind of action plans we can provide. For example, from a social perspective, support group is a, is a, is a big thing. Almost every big institute offers support groups. During COVID, that was switched to online resources. This helps build relationship it helps patients see other patients who may be going through similar crisis and they feel that they're, they're not alone in their journey. Emotional support is a, is a big component of, of what I think this framework can, can, can work on. Just appreciating on where they are in their stage of their healing. I personally like a lot of psychotherapy for my, my patient populations. Almost, almost everyone I, I recommend for them to go for some therapy to, to get to that acceptance mode uh, from the stroke. Spirituality, whether it's a religious, non-religious, 
meditation, mindfulness, yoga are very helpful tools to kind of think about if you want to try to connect patients with spirituality. But also, again, it, it goes back to understanding where, what stages of their grief and what their beliefs are. Occupational, when can I get back to work? How can we get them back to doing what they used to do? Like my patient was in, is a nuclear plant engineer. After a big bleed, how can I get her back to where she see, where she can go work as a, as a high functioning status? And you, have, you have tools to help with that, physical therapy, rehabilitation, occupation therapy, speech therapy, cognitive therapy. But can you also add art, music, journaling, fit exercise to this, to this to get back to them where they, where they need to go? Financial, social determinants of health, are we all talking about it? If we're if we're prescribing medications, prescribing supplements and herbals, can they afford it? Connecting them to a financial counselor. Intellectually, I think everyone wants to empower themselves in this journey. How can we educate them, give them resource to uh, for them to to uh, empower themselves? And then physical environment, make sure they're safe. Are they a fall risk? What can we change around the houses? to make sure that they're not having a fall and having a, 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 another complication from stroke. What is some data on some of these action plan that I just mentioned? I think everyone is aware of physical activity. 30 minutes of moderate exercise have shown in multiple, multiple studies improve cardiovascular risk factors, including stroke. But what you may not be aware is it also shown to improve outcomes after stroke. Multiple meta-analyses have shown cognitive function improvement, improvement in depression symptoms, strength improvement, improvement in their disability scales, arm motor function, and reducing fall risk with improving balance. They've also done some animal models, which have shown to reduce the size of infarct. I'm not aware of any literature that have looked at if someone who was exercising routinely, whether they have a different outcomes after a stroke, but definitely after a stroke, there is a benefit of from, a, from a prevention perspective as well as recovery perspective. What about nutrition? So far, Mediterranean diet probably has the best data of preventing another stroke. The odds ratio in multiple meta-analysis is 0.64. There's also some data looking at just plant-based. Although I, at least in my clinic, I feel that it's easier for me to transition patients from a, a, a Western diet to a more of a Mediterranean diet to directly to the plant-based diet. Because it allows for some compromise. You, you, you're increasing your fruits, vegetables, lagoons, nuts, seeds, whole grains, more fish, right? And really cutting down your processed meat or unprocessed meat and processed carbohydrates. DASH diet, if you're trying, if someone has uncontrolled uh, hypertension, has shown to improve high blood pressure. The MIND diet, which has shown to improve some cognitive. And then there were a couple, of pa couple, pa 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 couple of research paper talking about high protein during recovery, which have, has shown to improve outcomes from recovery perspective. What about micronutrients? Now, vitamin D goes up and down, up and down in the literature for actually a lot of diseases that we deal with commonly, but also for stroke. This was a population-based based study which looked at vitamin D level and they looked at patients having, you know, uh, having strokes. And what they found is that very low level, and they defined that as below 30, was high risk for having uh, ischemic strokes. But when you look at this, um, when, when you look at the study in detail, below 20 level, this effect actually did not, did not exist. So I, I, I don't know what that means. Do you, do you try to keep them above 30 for the entire time or you try to keep them very low below 20? Vitamin C, lycopene, uh, chemical from your, your red, red vegetables like, like uh, tomatoes, magnesium, potassium, calcium, folic acid, folic acid and vitamin B6, folic acid, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12, they have all shown in one way or other reduced risk for strokes. 
The folic acid is 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 also interesting. The trial that 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 uh, talked about that is they compared a folic acid, folic acid and vitamin B six, and folic acid, vitamin B six, and vitamin B twelve. And turns out that folic acid had the most beneficial compared to the other two. What about supplements? Are there any supplements that shown improvement? And this data is is not really does not really exist specific for stroke patients. Now we know that there is a lot of data on cardiovascular disease uh, risk reduction with supplements, but from from a specific stroke perspective, this is this does not exist a lot. And for the time sake, I didn't want to get into talking about the, all the supplement herbal for cardiovascular disease. But two that I, I do want to mention is, is, is pomegranate, which is actually in a randomized trial, which showed improvement in cognition as well as function improvement. And vitamin D, again, this trial looking at a, a outcome measures, not really prevention measures, and it showed that there was a better outcome. The table on the right kind of talks about what has shown to reduce stroke risk and what has shown to increase stroke risk. If you want to look at more details, these are specific foods and biochemicals from, uh, uh, from, from the nutrients that, that has shown to either benefit or harm or increase risk for stroke. So what are things that's shown? It's the it's same, same theme across the board, fruits, vegetable, olive oil, fish, coffee, tea in this cohort, where processed meat, unprocessed meat, increased risk. The, the vitamin C, D, magnesium I talked about already. Again, folic acid. What about for depression? I think this is one of the most common symptoms we see. Yes, there are, there's a lot of literature supporting pharmacotherapy, but a lot of patients don't want to don't, don't want to take uh, uh, medications. Like my patients that I'll tell you, uh, the, like my patients that I had. There have been 21 studies, and this was uh, um, a review articles combining all those studies from 1992 to 2016, and they've looked at all these different modalities that we can utilize to improve depressive symptoms music, exercise, light. So can we use this as adjunctant to pharmacotherapy to improve the depression symptoms, perhaps improve the improve uh, overall outcomes after stroke? What about mind-body approaches? Music have shown to improve sensory processing, cognitive recovery, and improve focus and attention, which I think is a big, big, component of, of their recovery. In order for them to have a, in my opinion, in order for them to have a good recovery, the focus is so important for them to have the mindset of that they were gonna get better. But because of the other complications that we see, this doesn't allow them to give that focus for recovery. They're distracted by their social circumstances, their emotional circumstances, their financial circumstances. So I, I commonly recommend music for, for majority of my patients. What about mindful-based meditations has shown to improve mental health symptoms like depression, anxiety, improve quality of life. Yoga, reduce anxiety, depression, lowers blood pressure. Mind-body exercise like Tai Chi, shown to improve ADLs, reduce fall risk, improves balance. Art therapy, as I, was, or, or, as I already mentioned in the late study, improves confidence, improves depression, gives the patients and family new, new personal sense. Thai massages have shown to decrease spasticity, improve quality of life. And acupuncture, uh, a lot of lead literature for this comes from China, which has shown to reduce fatigue, improve mobility and improve ADLs. So let's get back to my patient. Remember this 45 year old with nuclear plant engineer? I worked with her for a few years, which we thought was a success story, but she was significantly impacted by her, her mental health. And we tried multiple modalities, including a multiple different uh, medications, therapy, psychiatrist evaluations. And the formula that we found for, for her was the mind-body approach is involving meditation, yoga, journaling, 
there's typo there. Nutrition, she, she actually became vegan. Increased physical activity. And the last visit I had with her, she had significant improvement in anxiety, her PTSD, she's back to driving, and now she's pursuing a career in yoga. She couldn't get back to her working as an engineer given the high stress and the requirement the job had. What about the second patients? This, this is a guy with a, a brain stem stroke, basal artery stenosis, uncontrolled cardiovascular risk factors. The last um, blood work I have for him, he quit smoking and alcohol. He's found ways to cope by keeping himself busy. His hemoglobin A1C is down to 6.7. LDL is 57. He's not had a stroke. The risk of stroke for patients with the intracranial atherosclerotic disease is significant. And perhaps the basal of narrowing caliber may be improving. Now, this may be a biased observation, but may be improving. So I see that as a win. Now I can't say that this was all just complementary, alternative or lifestyle changes. There was a role for a pharmacotherapy along with this. It's a combination to the framework that I was referring to. We put patient in the center, we made lifestyle changes, we applied conventional complementary alternative modalities to get outcomes that, that we, we, we all hope for. And Lastly, I just want to tell you, I uh, just want to give you some more quotes from that lay study. And the reason I'm keep going back to this one is, is these are these are important psychosocial stresses that we usually don't address, that we cannot measure. But this simple, simple things as the lays can significantly improve one person's quality of life. They allow me to put thoughts into action gave me opportunity to experience a deep sense of enjoyment that I have missed for a long time since the stroke. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to make my own choice and decisions. Despite my disability after the stroke, I proved to myself that I can do it and I'm still capable. The stroke may have affected some aspects of my ability. Hence, I'm not doing it efficiently as before. However, this does not mean that I cannot perform, perform as well as before. I should not pity myself. And just take a moment to think about this, some of these quotes. So in conclusion, I think optimal framework, whether you want to call it a system of care is needed for, to support stroke survivors. I think personally, integrated stroke care framework can help address these post-stroke stroke complication, unmet needs, and cardiovascular risk factors. There needs to be, I think, more research with randomized trials to demonstrate its benefits in the, in the real world. And with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, and just a reminder to please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, so we have three questions so far. Well, actually, one brief one was, can we get a copy of the slide presentations? Um, well, I know that the, uh, the actual video will be posted on IFAM and on the OSHER site. So hopefully that will serve your needs. Um, so Dr. Pandya, I know you talked about the exercise um, being so important and there was a question about whether it's known about the mechanism of action, like how does it happen that matter, uh, moderate exercise helps heal the brain, in particular short-term memory and executive functions of planning, organizing, and problem solving. And, um, and, and so that was one question, like, you know, what is the mechanism of action of exercise and healing? And then relatedly, um, uh, in terms of physical activity, how do you counsel people? Because, uh, you know, there's, a, of course, in many cases, a risk of falls, um, balance issues, and how, how, you know, how do you balance that risk against trying to encourage more moderate to vigorous exercise? 
Yeah, there's a really, really good question. So to answer the first question, you know, there are uh, the, some data suggesting that the, the, the reason physical activity helps improve outcome is it improves neuroplasticity and angiogenesis. And perhaps this is because, as, as we're all aware, this increases cardiac output, perhaps increasing a oxygenation um, to the brain where you have a, a higher rate of oxygen, oxygenation with utilization. But that's the best explanation that I can give you for mm -hmm. how exercise improves uh, cognitive as well as other, other uh, stroke outcomes. For the second question, that is a, also really, really good question, right? Because this is, these are the challenges that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is why, where I think this type of a framework where you have a collaborations with multitudes of professions, including rehabilitations, including an, uh, a vascular neurologist, including a, a social worker, where you can come putting the patients in the center, addressing their individual needs. So if for, for example, if someone is a fall risk, are, is there a, a plan that you can create for them where they can do exercise while sitting, right? Or support. Can they be can they can they participate with physical therapy to get that moderate exercise that they need? And this is kind of where multitude of uh, disciplines has to come together for that plan. Thank you. Um, and then there's a some other questions. So um, do you have any recommendations for, uh, you know, patients who have aphasia post-stroke and are there workbooks? Do you um, have particular texts that you might recommend for people with that condition post-stroke? Yeah, that's us, awesome. you know, and, and so one thing that we, we're doing in our clinic is we, we're cre creating a resource center, right? So we, we're putting together resources um, whenever we come across it. And a lot of times we learn about these resources from patients and family. So we do have a resources together for aphasia patients and a lot, a lot that to do with uh, apps that are available that they can use on a on, on routine basis. Now, some of them are free. Some of them are uh, um, um, per they, they cost money, but I have a lot of patients that I recommend that to, and they've 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 given me a lot of positive feedback. So I'm happy to share that. You know, I'm happy to give you my email. You can email me. And I'm happy to share that with whoever asked that question. Wonderful, thank you. Um, then people always like hearing real stories. So it says for patient MS, besides pharmacotherapy. What do you feel were the other interventions that really helped the patient? Did she choose one of the diets that you mentioned? Did she join a support group or exercise? Which ones did you uh, did she choose, and that you felt helped her with her recovery? Uh, and I, 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 and thanks for that question. I think it's it's multi, it's it's combination. And more and more I do this, I, I'm learning that it's not a a, a one size fits all model. I think there's not a one answer to a lot of these things that patients are going through. Um, one thing that, that really helped helps, I think, is just being there with the pa patients. I think, you know, being there with them in their journey, letting them know that you're there, you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna dismiss them. You're there, you're gonna, you're gonna do what you, what you can to help them get through this. Um, and that's all we did. And all the other tools that we added, I think were complementary to that. But just letting her know that she's gonna get better, that you know this is a journey, and um, and and we, we find a common ground that fits her needs, and that we can get to. Yeah, and that goes to the core. The first sentence in the a definition of integrative medicine is, you know, the importance of the provider-patient relationship, and you know I think it just speaks to the role of hope. Um, the, the role of, um, you know, feeling you have a partner on your team, uh, even if they don't have all the answers, they're there to help you. Um, so, you know, clearly you're, you excel in that. 
Um, there's a question about um, uh, spiritual approaches and, um, uh, you know, and, and I think you mentioned and patients with stroke may have PTSD and other sorts of things. And I know, you know, spirituality when it comes to a major trauma um, can manifest in different ways, depending on, you know, for some people, it becomes a uh, a source of strength. And for others, it can actually lead to a more negative effect if there's a sense of um, of being penalized or, or uh, in, in a, you know, this being something that showed that their spiritual belief didn't hold for them. Um, so what, what role do you see that playing? And, and do you include that when you're talking to your patients after stroke? Um, since I know spirituality is personally important for you too. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I, I would say I don't have data to say that this is evidence proven, right? But, you know, personal experience, personal bias, uh, spirituality in the recovery is is a, is a key component, and and I'll, I'll I'll also say that it's religious versus non-religious spirituality, right? Because you know there are patients who are not religion, but they you know they're spiritual, right? They they feel connected to universe, they feel connected to nature, and then there there are patients who are who are uh, spiritual but very religious, you know, uh, the the faith that they believe in, and as Dr. Ring mentioned, it's absolutely correct, right? They can go in both direction, and this is. Why, when I, when I mention the framework, the first step is to understand where the patients are, right? What stages of the grief? A lot of time when they are in a stage where they're angry with their spirituality, they're, they're, they're in the angry phase, right? Because they're saying, well, how could this happen to me? You know, I, can't, I, I, I came and prayed every Sunday, how could this happen? To me? And as a, as a in, in, in our clinic, at least what we try to do is try to get them from that angry phase to the acceptance phase. And it's not an easy task. Um, sometimes it takes a long, long time to do that. But ultimately, with time, I think ultimately almost everyone kind of gets to that acceptance stage. And then once they have at the acceptance stage, you try to incorporate their spirituality into their well being. Right? So a lot of times, I'll, if I understand that patient spirituality is connected to their prayers, going to church or, or any other temples or mosques, I will try to incorporate that in care plan. Instead of med recommending meditation, mindfulness, yoga, I'll just say, hey, why don't you just pray three, four times a day? So make some time for yourself to connect to your spirituality. Do I think it helps? Yes. Do I have data? No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a study about, uh, there's a question about, and I don't know if you know the data on this, um, but certainly acupuncture is used for a lot of um, everything from neuropathy and pain um, to other symptoms that might happen in this setting. And uh, the question is, have you, are you aware of studies that examine the role of e-STEM acupuncture on activities of daily living and mental recovery? Um, and I, I know like you were mentioning, a lot of the data comes from the East, but uh, any, any comment on, is there a preferred form of acupuncture, preferred timing? Um, how do you, you know, how do you incorporate those kinds of recommendations? So the, the acupuncture, when you look at specifically from a, from a stroke recovery perspective, and I, I can't, you know, I, I'm happy to share that, uh, that, that paper with you. I don't, I don't remember which acupuncture points that they, they use uh, for that trial, but they did show that it improved uh, fatigue and this overall quality of life. Okay. Now, there are some, some, the times that I use acupuncture in my practice a lot of time is for smoking cessation. So I use acupuncture recommendations uh, along with, you know, other, other behavioral changes for, 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 uh, uh, for smoking cessation. 
Do I think there may be a role for acupuncture in, in, in post-stroke care? I, I think so. I just don't think we have a data to recommend that to every single patient that comes in the door yet. What about, um, uh, there is a question about how, you know, this gets to access issues. So for some holistic approaches, um, many holistic approaches, we can say there may be barriers based on the income level of participants. And I know that you started a nonprofit, you know, to address exactly these kinds of issues. Um, how do you address this in your practice with patients trying to make sure that uh, access to these important strategies are available for everyone regardless of their means? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very challenging, right? That's, that's probably one of the challenge. I think some of the challenges recommending some of the things that I just mentioned, right? One is, is belief. So you're trying to change the, the mindset from, hey, um, why can't I just you know, take a medication, right? So that, that belief, changing that mindset is very, very important. And, and second is the access, right? How, you know, how can you provide access to some of these individuals? And, and, and the third thing I'll even mention that these, these modalities may be accessible, available, but the focus may not be what you're looking for, right? If you, if, you know, for example, if I'm looking for a specific for fatigue, it may not be available. And this is where the first step is so important, establishing that baseline, understanding where your patient is from, from, a, from a social perspective, from their belief perspective, from their financial perspective. And usually when I, when in my first few meetings, is what, this is when I, what I'm establishing, and my recommendations are based on those uh, uh, baseline. So if I think that someone is unable to afford to go for yoga, meditation, I will not give them a referral to a yoga studio or meditation mindfulness, right? But we, have, we have put together some YouTube videos that we would provide them, which is free for them to use. It's not standardized, but at least it, that's something that they can use. Right, so there's online resources. There's significant online. The one that I, I use a lot for my elderly patients for, for physical activities, I think it's called Sit, Sit, Sit and Be Fit, um, which has a lot of exercises for elderly patient population, even has some yoga. So I use a lot that for my elderly patients. So using the online resources these days is, is helpful for people who cannot have access. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a quick question, were the patients you presented, would you consider them mildly or moderately impaired? Uh, this question was from a rehab professional and was just thinking about overall function. So, so the, uh, the second patient didn't have a lot of uh, rehabilitation issue, right? It was more of a cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic disease, stroke risk. The first one was, I think, severely impacted. It impact, you know, when, when we look at it from a, from a data perspective, you know, the, the, the major thing that we look at is modified ranking scale, which is a, a physical functional status, C would be zero, because C would have really no deficit. She's able to take care of her ADLs, she's able to ambulate, she's able to have a conversation. But what her deficits are, are, are things that modified ranking scale does not measure. It impacted her quality of life where she couldn't even drive. She couldn't even have a social life. She couldn't work. So I think it's not even moderate. I think it's severe impacting their quality. And this was actually one of the, these are the patients with one of the main reason why I, I, you know, I, I went and did a fellowship in integrated medicine. And what other tools can I give them to help them, you know, to support them in their journey? Thank you. And then um, there's a last question. It doesn't relate to stroke. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase it and let you pass if it's not in your wheelhouse. Um, so there's a question about um, uh, long COVID, which of course many people have um, neurologic symptoms post COVID. I don't know if that's something that you see in your practice because I know you specialize in, in stroke. Um, 
but if it is, is that something that you've seen? And, uh, you know, is there something that you recommend to people um, who have severe exercise intolerance and uh, are suffering from these kinds of things? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't see a lot of post-COVID uh, um, patients in my clinic. I have few you know, that I've seen for strokes who have this post-COVID syndrome, the phenomena, the extreme you know, brain fogging and fatigue and tiredness, uh, motivated. And, and with time, most of them actually have improved significantly. My observation in, in my end, it goes to like maybe five. <laughs> they, there is a, there's always, I find an underlying psychosocial stressors or mental health associated with them. So what I try to do with them at least is try to work on those factors and see if, 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 if that helps them overcome the other symptoms. And, and, and going back to you know, their fatigue, how do you get them to motivate to do um, physical activity, that 30 minutes a day of moderate or, or you know, rigorous activity? And, it, and it, it's again, goes back to that understanding the baseline, perhaps come, you know, if you had a team in place that works together to come up with a plan that's specific for that patient would be a very, very useful tool to have. Yeah, meeting people where they are. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to have you for the Osher IFAM Grand Rounds. Um, I look forward to learning more uh, at the meeting at the end of February. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much.